Hey y'all, uh, my name is Aaron Thomas. I'm one of the associate pastors here and we're glad you've chosen today to, to worship with us and spend time in the word with us. Uh, and so if you have a Bible or, or an app on your phone, uh, please turn to, to Matthew chapter five. We're gonna be at the end of that chapter, starting in verse 43. And uh, some of the things that Jesus asks us to do are really, really hard. Uh, most of the things Jesus asks us to do are really hard. And uh, I think this is one of the most difficult things that we are asked to do in all of Scripture, and that is to love our enemies. Uh, this is something that's been on my mind lately, and, and maybe it's been on your mind as well in the, the kind of cultural moment we're in where it seems like everyone is making an enemy of someone. Uh, as believers, we are called to love our enemies and I, I think I can say this with, uh, with relative certainty that this is probably one of the things that I am the worst at in, as a Christian in, in my, my personal walk with Jesus. Um, but based on that current cultural moment and the, the disagreements over masks and uh, how to have church during COVID and who should be the president and how to handle the race problem in America and all these other things, I'm assuming that I'm not the only one who struggles with this. Friends and, and church... It, it can't be this way. We can't be constantly making enemies of one another. Uh, and it's not just that we need to, to not hate or uh, that all you need is love and we just need to be uh, at peace with one another and, and work things out. Um, it's not just that this is a good idea. We are literally commanded by our Creator, by our Savior, to love our enemies. And people's souls depend on it. People's, people's lives, their quality of life depends on us doing this well. Um, God has instructed us on how to live in Scripture, and it's not just that He wants to tell us what to do, but He's, he's giving us uh, instructions for life so that we will flourish as human beings, so that we can live together in harmony with one another. And it is hard, um, but this thing is, is required of us, and it's made possible for us through the Holy Spirit. And God gave us uh, these instructions first. He gave them to us in the Old Testament. The first five books are called the Torah to Jews, and, and that is the law. God gave those, or those laws to the Jews. There were 613 laws in the Old Testament, and Jews tried to live by those laws. And as, as Jesus, when He came, as He lived and as He taught, He brought clarity to misinterpretations of the law. As, as the religious leaders messed up their understanding and then were teaching that, that misunderstanding to others, Jesus often brought clarity to that. And the passage that we're looking at today is inside a larger section called the Sermon on the Mount. And in that sermon, Jesus hones in specifically on some things that had been misinterpreted and misapplied, and He wanted to correct that for His listeners. And so hopefully um, it'll be a correction for us today as well. So we're going to start by looking at verse 43, which says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So the first part of this, love your neighbor, is all over the Old Testament. It's all throughout the Old Testament. And even when Jesus is challenged by religious leaders, they ask him, what is the greatest commandment? He tells them that first it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the people who heard him say that agreed with his assessment, of his summary of the law. And so it was agreed upon that loving your neighbor was something that, that you should do, uh, even among the Jewish leaders. But then this second part is where the misinterpretation comes in, because hate your enemy uh, is never in Scripture. It, it never shows up there, although it's understanding uh, or it's understandable how we get to that place, because in the Old Testament, God talks about his disdain for evil, and people who were against him and opposed him are even referred to as enemies in places. And, and as they were standing in defiance of God, they, they functionally were his enemies. But nowhere in Scripture are we commanded or, or instructed to hate our enemies. It's, it's, easy, uh, it's easy for us to understand how they would have accepted that, though. Like, it makes sense to us. Love your neighbor unless your neighbor's a jerk because who wants to love somebody who's a jerk? Uh, it's okay to hate them because they backed into your car and did, and left without leaving a note or whatever. They Maybe your physical neighbor broke something or a tree fell on your property and you had to pay for it and they didn't, they didn't cover any of the damages or whatever. There's so many reasons that we find to, to dislike our neighbor. 
And today, when we think of enemies, it's a little different. The, the context for the Jews, they had, had real, real enemies. Throughout their entire history as a people, the, the nations surrounding them were, were in direct opposition of them and were even attacking to kill them. To, to limit their flourishing and to control them. And at the time when Jesus spoke these words, they were under the control of Rome. And Rome did not care for the Jews. And so they, they had very real enemies that they could point to, which actually makes Jesus' words to them even more shocking and, and crazy to think about. Because in verse 44, he says, But I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. Which, like, of course, you know, easy, easy to do, right? What's next, Jesus? Let's let's get on down the line. Like, no, it's it's so hard for us to do this, to think about loving and praying for people who who want the worst for us. But we're to love and not hate, to love and not spite, to love and, and not rant about or vent about or gossip about, to, to love and pray for your enemies, your specific enemies. And I think it's important for us to take a minute and talk about who our enemies are. Um, You may have specific individuals who've come to mind or groups of people who've come to mind as we talk about enemies, Uh, but I think we need to make a a clarification and and a distinction. The first is that we need to understand who is the enemy. As we're talking about enemies, we need to understand who the enemy is. Because as Christians, there is only one enemy. And his name is Satan. That's the way he's referred to in Scripture. He stands in direct opposition to us, and he is not human. Uh, Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There, there's a very real enemy called, called Satan, and he has one goal, and that is to make you love anything more than you love God. Any, anything else. His aim is to get you to love and desire anything over and above God. And if he can't do that, then what he's going to do is, is try to distract you or disable you from leading others to love God. And this distinction is important because if we're not careful, what we start doing when we think about our, our human enemies and people we stand in opposition to is we start demonizing them as if they themselves are uh, Satan. Or we throw around the, the title Antichrist to talk about people. Or um, the, the phrase demoncrat gets thrown around all the time. Like we, we demonize individuals and people uh, to a point that, that we're, we're not supposed to. We're not called to think of others in that way. Democrats are not demons. Republicans are not demons. Your neighbor who plays the drums at 1 a.m. and thinks that God is dead is not a demon. Everyone who thinks differently than you is not against God and His church. They may be, but everyone who disagrees with you is not. We're we're not all going to agree on how to handle the race issue. We're not going to agree on who the president should be. We're not going to agree on how to have church during COVID. And disagreeing on these things does not make us uh, this type of uh, demonized enemy. But that's what we're being fed if you pay attention, if you're on social media and you pay attention to that feed, the, the more time you spend on it, unless you're very conscious about uh, making sure you're following uh, sort of diverse points of view, you're going to start seeing the same things over and over again. And wherever you get your news, if you get it from the same sources, then those sources are likely telling you that whoever is on the other side of where you stand right now is the worst thing that, that could happen to this country or to the world, that they're immoral and they're, they're tearing apart the moral fabric of our country or of just human existence. And maybe even your family and friends are telling you that as well. And we have to fight against that. It's a, it's a problem for us to think like this because when we demonize humans, we no longer see them as image bearers of God, which is what we're told they, that we all are in Scripture. We all bear God's image. And so if we, we demonize people, we don't see them as that. Now we start to see them as instruments of evil, and we justify our hatred towards them. We, we lose the desire to love them and to pray for them. It's like they're beyond redemption in our minds. Or if we do pray for them, our prayers are more, God, you need to get them. You need to make them pay rather than being, God, forgive them. Give them grace. Give them life. Y'all, we have one enemy, and we need to remember that our fight is against him and not against other men and women. 
hating people is against the way of Jesus. We need to see that as anti-Christian. So that's the enemy, but who are your enemies? While we don't want to think of people as evil, there are people who, who are hostile towards us in our lives. We all have enemies. But maybe you're like me and you don't really want to label people as enemies. That, that's been something I've realized about myself as I've wrestled with this passage. I don't want to call people enemies. And I think that I'm realizing that that is rooted in my own pride. Like I want to imagine myself as being so loving that I don't have any enemies. Like I'm Mr. Rogers or something. And if you have spent any amount of time with me, you know that I'm not Mr. Rogers. Um, maybe you're thinking, why would it be a problem for us to not think of people as enemies? Like why, why would it be a problem to not label them as, as enemies? And there's some validity to that question. Because right now it's too common for people to think of others as enemies. But I see it as a problem for myself because I convinced myself that I had no enemies so that when I read verses like this, they didn't strike me. They didn't convict me because I thought of myself as somehow above, being above having enemies. And only really in the last couple of weeks have I realized that me thinking that way was a way for me to skirt around and get out of having to apply this scripture to my life, personally to my life. Because I don't call people my enemies, I just call them idiots. Like when they disagree with me, I'm just like, oh, that person is annoying, they're obnoxious, they, they frustrate me. Like I don't, I don't label them as enemies, so when I read love your enemies, I'm not thinking I need to love those people, which is exactly what I should be doing. Now, I'm not arguing that we should be quick to declare someone an enemy, but there are people who make your life harder than it should be. There, there are people who are overly critical or undermining of you. There, there are people who are opposed to your pursuit of Christ and your involvement in His church. The people who've legitimately wronged you. And there are people who you have legitimately wronged and now have become functional enemies for you. Sometimes they live inside your own home. I was talking about this with my wife, Jenna, this week, and we were, we were just talking about the, the statistic that's often quoted that 50% of marriages end in divorce, which means half of, of people listening to this who are married possibly are thinking of their spouse inside their home more of as an enemy than as a, a partner or a lover or a friend. And if that's you, if, if you're living in that kind of tension in your home where you feel like your spouse is an enemy, I encourage you to read this scripture and apply it to your marriage. Love them and pray for them. While they may not want you dead and, and not be an enemy to that level, they can be functioning as enemies to you and, and to your walk with Christ, or your walk with the Lord. When we see people as enemies, we can accept our responsibility to love them and pray for them as Jesus commands. And then when you do this, a funny thing starts to happen. And I, I've mentioned that I'm bad at this. I, I know that I'm bad about this. Um, the last couple of weeks, I've tried to be more intentional about this, and especially in the last five days or so, where I'm, I'm daily trying to carve out time for me to pray specifically for the, the flourishing and for the good of people who, who seem like they are in opposition to me. And the more I've done that, the less I feel like they are my enemy and the more I feel love towards them. I, I see ways that I can help them or, or serve them. And then I'm not bitter in the same ways about, about serving them. It's, and this is not some light switch thing. And this is right now, I'm, get, I'm talking about, my, my test case is not very long. We're talking about the last five days, but I have seen a difference in the last five days of my life in the way I'm thinking about people who function as enemies to me. And is it easy to do this? Absolutely not. But should we still do it? Of course. Now, are we going to fail at it? Yes. But as we do this, I think people are going to go from being our enemies to no longer being enemies. And as Christians, we're able to, to love functional enemies in our lives because God loves us and we're no longer enemies of Him. So much of what we do when we gather in the church and watching sermons, listening to sermons online, so much of this is just reminders for us. It's, it's us taking time to try to remember who God is and who we are in relationship to Him. And so if some of what we're talking about right now is, is something you've heard before, I encourage you not to tune that out. 
We need these reminders. I need these reminders. Everyone, everyone watching this, everyone on this earth is either currently an enemy of God or formerly an enemy of God. And the only way to not be an enemy is through faith in the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. God made us along with everything else that there is in existence. He, he spoke it into existence. He, he created us to live in loving harmony with one another and with Him. But, but we rejected His rule. We, we preferred to do things our own way, and, and we, we rejected Him. And when we did that, that, that rebellion against God was sin. That's what the Bible calls sin. It's, it's missing the mark of God's standard of living, God's standard of perfection. We rejected Him. Sin comes into the world, and we became enemies of God. Every, every person on the earth is an enemy of God apart from Jesus. But God loves mankind, and rather than abandon us in, the, in that, He's been working throughout human history to bring us to Himself. After we made ourselves God's enemies, He came after us. And ultimately, Jesus, who is God the Son, God in the flesh, left heaven, entered into our sin-filled mess. And He lived a perfect sinless life and did it so that He could be our substitute. He had no sin of His own to pay for, to, to take the consequence for, and so He was able to, to take our sin onto Himself, my sin, your sin, onto Himself and pay that consequence. He drank the full wrath of God for our sin. And He did this in the place of His enemies. He died in our place. That's, that, that is love. When, when God tells us to love our enemies, this is the type of sacrificial love He's talking about. Love that made enemies into sons and daughters. And we know that this is true because Jesus did not stay dead, but He rose from the grave having victory over death and declaring everything that He said to be true. And we can trust that today. We, we gather uh, when we gather with believers and we, we listen to sermons so that we can remind ourselves of this truth Romans 5, 8, it tells us that God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were enemies of God, but He died in our place and we are no more. And as He hung bloodied on the cross, beaten and actively being mocked by the very people who He was there to die for, He did exactly what He commands us to do right here. And He prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. As, as Tim Keller puts it, he's a pastor in New York. Um, he says, we are saved by a man who died loving his enemies. We are saved by a man who died loving his enemies. That's our, our motivation for loving our enemies because we know what it's like to be loved as an enemy of God. We, we know that apart from God's grace and mercy in our lives, we would still be enemies. And so we can look at others when they cause us great pain and bring suffering and strife into our lives. We can look at them and forgive them and love them and pray for their flourishing, pray for their salvation. If they're not believers, pray for them to, to grow and to live. And when we do this, we, we're reflecting God in the world. Loving your enemies reflects God in the world. Verse 45 says, so we do this, love your, love your enemies so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So when it says, so that you may be sons of your Father, it doesn't mean that we become sons of God through loving our enemies. It just means that we display our child of God status when we love our enemies. We, we're showing the world that we, were, we are actually children of God because we're loving our enemies. They, they see it in us. When we do good for our enemies, we are reflecting Him in our lives. And children naturally want to, to be like their parents. Um, my kids put my shoes on or my wife's shoes on and clop around the house. They, they pretend to go to work. They pretend to go to the store. They pretend that they have our jobs. Um, and when COVID first hit and we started doing more things online, we started recording announcement videos. And most weeks I would do that. 
and our kids always wanted to watch those videos and I didn't think anything about that but about a month ago uh, Eva who is our oldest stood up on the couch and got everyone's attention and declared that she was going to begin teaching and so then she starts just randomly spouting off everything she can remember about every Bible lesson we've ever talked about in the house um, and that goes on for a little bit and she gets to the end of it and she kind of smirks and says we love you church which is the, when I record announcement videos, that's the way that I close them. And in that, like Eva wanted to be like me in that moment. She, she, kids want to be like their parents and children of God want to be like him. And God is one who loves his enemies. We want to be like God, even when it's hard for us. And then in this, there, there's reward for us. Uh, verse 46 says, it begins, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? And, that, and there it's implying that there's a reward from loving your enemies. In 1 Peter 3, 9, it says not to return evil for evil or insult for insult so that you may inherit a blessing. This isn't just about uh, making life easier for people here and now, although we want to do that as believers. There's reward and blessing in heaven for us as we choose to love our enemies. And verse 46 continues, so if you just love those who love you, do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? The, the way of Jesus is radically different than the way of the world. Non, non-believers, even like people who are corrupt and, and angry and people see them like that, they typically don't have a problem loving people who love them in return. But Jesus is calling us to to something more. As Christians, we're called to love our neighbors and friends. We're called to love those who love us, but also love our enemies. And it's hard, but we're not in it alone. When you believe the gospel, God the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. He dwells in you to help you live and love the way that Jesus does. And He empowers us to live like Jesus. That doesn't mean that we become weird little Jesus robots. It doesn't mean that it's not hard because it is still very hard. Following Jesus, is, Jesus refers to it as dying to yourself every day. And loving your enemies is a, a really intense uh, picture of dying to yourself or practice of dying to yourself. It's still hard, but it's not impossible. We can love the way that God intends us to. So uh, I want to just remind you of 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, as it talks about love. When we think about loving our enemies, this is how we need to, to act towards them. So love is patient and kind. Are we patient and kind to our enemies? Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant. Is that the way we are towards our enemies? It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So as you are are thinking about and wrestling with how to love your enemies, I encourage you to pray through that passage. How how can you be more patient and kind and and less arrogant and less rude? And how can you be more selfless in your relationships with people, especially in your relationships with your enemies? And uh, the the next thing, I just want to share this with you because I've found it to be helpful for myself, and I'm still wrestling with a lot of these things, but I have found uh, a few things that are enemy makers in my life. Uh, The first one is busyness. And busyness is like the American way. Everybody is busy all the time. But it is really hard to love people when you're busy. I've got to move on to the next thing. I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. We don't have time for interruptions. We don't have time for people to... to, uh, hurt on us or hurt beside us. Busyness is an enemy uh, maker in our lives because as people interrupt us because we have a schedule that we have to keep, then we're frustrated at them and we think that they're the one who calls all these problems as everything stacks up because they they slowed us down. Um, Hurry is another one and it's tied to busyness. Hurry is, it is hard to love people when you're in a hurry. And if you don't believe that, then just think about driving your car and being late somewhere and someone pulling out in front of you and doing five under the speed limit. 
Do you feel loving towards them in that moment? Because I know that I don't. Hurry, hurry makes enemies in our lives. Also, tiredness. When, when we don't sleep, it, it, it is hard to love people when you're wore out. And there are lots of different causes for that. I, I know you, you may be tired and it's completely out of your hands. And so I'm not saying uh, that you have to correct that. But if you're tired because you just choose to stay up too late and, and sleep badly, uh, you are at least uh, you are giving a foothold to the enemy to create more enemies in your life. Uh, and another thing is echo chambers, meaning that when, when you're just talking to people who believe the same way you believe, the more you talk to them, the, you're just hearing your own thoughts come back to you over and over again, and it just makes enemies of the other side. We see that most clearly in the news cycle and in politics. People, people who only talk to, to one side tend to demonize the other side, or, or at least make enemies of the other side. And so I want to encourage you to, to correct some of these and fight back against some of these if you struggle with them like I do. So leave room in your schedule to be interrupted. And that's hard to do. And it's not going to be easy. You, you're not going to be able to flip that switch and do that tomorrow. But think through that. Is it possible to cut some things out of my life to make it, make it okay for people to interrupt me? Jesus allowed people to interrupt him as he lived. And then slow down. Slow down. If you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see that Jesus was never, ever in a hurry. He, he, was, he, was, he had things to do. He was not lazy, but He was not in a hurry. We need to fight against this, this hurried nature of our culture so that we can be more like Jesus. And then sleep. Like people say, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And, and w- there's this idea that you just need to keep hustling and keep grinding and keep going. But God made us to sleep. We were designed that way, to need to sleep for seven or eight hours every night. And when we refuse to do that, we are rebelling directly against God and saying, I know better than you. I don't need that sleep. I can keep going like this. And what happens when you're tired is you snap at people, you're short with people, it's, more, it's easy to respond in anger. We need to sleep. Maybe you need to cut some things out of your schedule to make it possible for you to get more sleep. And, that, and you may be in a season of life where that is literally impossible because if you were a parent of a young kid or if you have other things going on, like you're just going to live through those seasons of, of tiredness. So I don't want you to to be overwhelmed by that. But if you're tired because you're just choosing not to sleep, that's what I'm talking about. You need to fight against that. Um, And then listen to other points of view. Broaden the sources that you get your news and information from. Broaden the the people you follow on social media. Learn what the other side has to say and listen to it from them and not just from your side's interpretation of what they have to say. It's important that we, we hear one another or we're just going to continue to, to make enemies and, and further uh, the divide between us. Let's be like our Father and love our enemies well, church. Verse 48 says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He is our standard. And I want to close with something that, that broke me in my, my preparation for this. I can't remember where exactly I, I read the, the, you know, whatever led me to this reference. But in the book of Acts, we learn about a man whose name is Stephen. And he was a follower of Jesus. He was faithful to do what Jesus called him to do. And he was proclaiming the gospel all throughout Jerusalem. And as he was doing that, people were rising up in opposition to him. And they were accusing him of telling lies. They accused him of all sorts of things. And Stephen ends up in front of the religious leaders. And they are grilling him and questioning him about why he's preaching what he's preaching, which is that Jesus rose from the grave and that salvation comes only through him. And Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, preaches this bold and amazing sermon. I encourage you to spend some time reading it this week, Acts chapter 7, where he he preaches that. And at the end of that chapter, um, as, as he calls these Jewish leaders to repent and believe, in their anger they rush at him. And in verse 58 of Acts 7, and then those following, it says, Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And when they stoned people, they would usually have them, they would stand on a hill the, the person they were stoning would be down low and everybody would pick up rocks and they would literally just throw rocks at them until that person died. This was a, a gruesome way 
to, to spend your last moments on earth. And so they, they stoned Stephen outside of the city and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep and Saul approved of his execution. So Stephen is being stoned for proclaiming the gospel, for refusing to back down from it. And Saul is standing by, just approving of this and, and participating in his way uh, by watching those, those coats in, in this execution of Stephen. And Stephen wants to be like his father in heaven. And he wants to be like Jesus. And at his own death, he prayed a similar prayer that Jesus prayed when Jesus was dying on the cross, when he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And Saul became Paul. And God answered Stephen's prayer, at least in part through Paul. Paul became a follower of Jesus and then the greatest missionary in the history of the world. And there's, there's no way for us to know this. So this is, this is purely speculation and kind of side note. I just want you to think about the possibility that when Paul, after, after going on all his missionary journeys and suffering for the name of Jesus the way that he did and finally being beheaded, when he, when he was beheaded and he met Jesus face to face, maybe the next face that he saw was the face of Stephen. Stephen who spent his last breath on earth praying for the forgiveness of Saul who would become Paul, who would become the missionary that spread the gospel through so much of the earth. The, the good news of Jesus makes family out of enemies and brings dead people to life. Saul and Paul were, were enemies in this life but brothers in eternity. And I encourage you, if you don't believe the gospel already, believe it today. And if you do believe it, then let's practice loving our enemies like Jesus. Jesus requires it, and the Holy Spirit makes it possible for us. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for, for who you are. God, we thank you for how you love us. And God, how you, you loved us even as we were enemies you did not write us off. You did not push us out. You did not cut us out of your life. You did not label us as toxic and leave. But God, you, you chased us down in the person of Jesus. And Jesus, you went to the cross with us on your mind as you were being mocked by the people you were dying for. You prayed for, for their forgiveness, for our forgiveness. And Holy Spirit, we need you to help us do this because this is not natural or normal. And we ask that you help us be people who love our enemies well, so that, God, you would be glorified in all the earth. And we pray these things in Jesus' awesome and holy name. Amen. Amen.